Welcome to The Sports Show, I'm Zamir Kareem. Uh, it's my pleasure today to talk to Canadian golf professional and coach Salima Musani. Uh, Salima, uh, golf has been such a huge part of your life for a long time now. Uh, when and where did the passion for the game start for you? For me, golf was kind of a, a lucky thing, uh, to be honest. I grew up in Ontario and I was playing a lot of sports in school, uh, eight sports. What else were you playing? And, uh, I played field hockey at the national level and then basketball, volleyball, soccer, softball, tennis, you name it, track, pretty much every event in track. Um, but I, I just was always into sports and uh, when I was 13, I took up golf and it was also lucky because nobody in my family played golf and my dad uh, had just taken up golf one of his patients had told him you know doctors don't work on Wednesdays they play golf <laughs> and so he took my dad and gave him a set of left-handed golf clubs and my dad started playing and me being the you know curious inquisitive athlete uh, wanted to join him and uh, we were on a vacation a few months later and uh, a pro saw me hitting golf balls and basically like ran out to my dad and told him like invest in her and so Ever since then, I've been I've been golfing. I was probably within a year of that that I was competing in golf, and I kind of never looked back. So you knew you were pretty good right from the beginning. Uh, I yeah, I just you know I was shooting, breaking a hundred uh, pretty easily, <laughs> and uh, competing in tournaments as a junior, like one day little invitationals and winning them all. And um, so yeah, you know when you're a competitor and you win. It's kind of fun. Yeah, and, and you talked about uh, playing golf in, in Ontario. You started obviously at a specific club in, in Ontario or a specific course, like close to you, close to where you live. Yeah, we was. I would started by being like a range yogi at our local like public course near where my mom worked. So she would drop me at like 8:30 in the morning, and I would pick golf balls and hang out all day, golf practice, and then she'd pick me up after work. And then uh, yeah, as I got older, we we became members at a club um, mm -hmm. and had more of a a settled place to play and practice and like that experience is, is pretty surreal to like go from something that you you don't know like or you've never seen a golf ball maybe or, or you've never picked up a golf club to then uh playing it was it did it feel similar to playing other sports uh, it did. The biggest difference, obviously, and probably um, the reason I chose golf was the individual nature of it. Most of the other things I was playing were team sports, and I think what I loved was I, I was I used I worked hard, and so I saw the I saw the benefits and I saw the the rewards uh, of my hard work paying off, and so I think that's what kind of attracted me to golf. Whereas team sports, you know, you can be in the best shape and you can do all the right things, but you don't always win. Yeah, especially if your team's not very good, then then you... Yeah. You, you, well, I mean, in golf, I also <laughs> learned that you lose more than you win. Mm -hmm. But I think what I really loved about it was what I put in is what I got out, mm -hmm. so... And and within five years, you're you're off to college, and, and you played in two different places in, in uh, college, and, and having gone from uh, South southern ontario and where you grew up in burlington to is it texas that you first landed I did. I did i went to the university of texas first so i was a longhorn for a couple of years and uh, then had the opportunity to to transfer mm -hmm. halfway through and was fortunate enough to to go to the west coast and 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 there you went to stanford university which is uh, like well renowned for many of their sports programs including golf and that's where tiger woods went right it is, so it is. uh that, like having that connection uh has to feel pretty cool and and not to mention the, the great football program that uh pete carroll uh built at stanford as well uh what was that experience like playing at the college level, at the collegiate level? And that's more of a team game as opposed to where it is more of an individual uh, game when you're when you're playing at, at, at the junior ranks. Yeah, for sure. So my yeah, my transition to Stanford was was amazing. It was you know I it was the best best thing that could have happened really, and uh, the opportunity I got to get an education there also. Um, but yeah, playing playing on a college team is different. I mean, it's it's an individual sport in a team setting. Um, and I think the, the transition part that was cool about that was you go from like being a junior alone to now you're, 
you're with like a pod of you know six to ten girls that you're practicing and working together as a team to achieve goals uh, and that kind of sets you up to then do the next phase which is the professional career where you are again on your own um, but it was uh, it was a great stepping stone and um, yeah it's like it kind of it's like a build-up of kind of changing the way you think and how you work and and, and in that group setting you learn you learn a lot about how to practice and, and what works for you and, and all that kind of stuff. So. Now, your your accolades include two PGA of BC championships, uh, a CPGA women's championship, winning the only major on the LPGA Symmetra Tour. Uh, so that's a lot of hardware. Uh, where did that drive uh, to be a competitor come from? Is that from your time playing all these other sports as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I grew up with two brothers, um, but funny enough, they're not they weren't very into sports um, so I, I'd like to say that was the reason um, but I'm not really sure I, I I think it's kind of one of those things that's somewhat genetic <laughs> I'd like to think I just my dad's very like he's pretty athletic and uh, he was a squash champion and uh, my mom and dad now both play golf like way more than I do <laughs> and actually my mom probably loves this sport more than anybody in our family which and she was the last one to start so it's kind of ironic uh, in a way but um, yeah I think it's just I've always been into sports so I think my competitiveness and my drive is everything comes out kind of in that uh, in that manner and I just want to take a take a step back and, and like look back at your time at, uh, in collegiate golf and what uh, was there a catalyst that helped make you make the decision to make that transfer between uh, Texas and, and uh, Stanford or is it just because it's Stanford uh, it was there were a few there are a few things um, that probably kind of yeah like you said catalyzed it and, and pushed me to kind of make the move um, Texas was a big school it's like you know I don't even remember the numbers now 50,000 50, people 60,000 yeah. undergrads and I grew up at a at a school from kindergarten to grade 11 where our graduating class was like 60 people wow. um, I did leave my senior of high school to go to Texas to San Antonio mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that was kind of part of the reason I chose Texas um, my parents were going to be nearby in the winters um, so there's a little bit of that uh, comfort mm -hmm. um, but as I kind of went through it I, I think I realized I preferred the smaller school the smaller feel mm -hmm. um, and obviously Stanford was <laughs> Stanford was probably the best choice I could have oh, made yeah. and I was fortunate enough to to get a scholarship and, and all that kind of stuff and, but, get, um, yeah. and getting the opportunity to, to live on, on the west coast just overlooking the ocean in Palo yeah. Alto yeah not a not I'd a never, <laughs> I'd never even really been to the west coast all our family vacations were down the east coast oh yeah uh, I'd never even never been to Vancouver until I moved here really um, so cool. yeah it's kind of a it's kind of interesting how it all works out and we're going to come back to that in just in just a little bit and uh but we all know you talked about your um uh, your family's love for the game now and 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 but your your decision to become a professional golfer or or, or how it came about can be somewhat i guess complicated by having immigrant parents uh i i, I know from from other people picking tra untraditional careers is, is can be like making that choice is a, a little harder but were your, was your family fully on board when you decided that professional golf was the way that you wanted to go? Yeah, you know, and this is this kind of goes back to me even just playing sports. Uh, my parents were always very supportive. Um, I used to sleep at my classmates' houses, you know, between games and school because they couldn't get there to pick me up or whatever. And uh, but they never stopped me. They never said, you know, you can't you can't be playing three sports right now because we can't manage it. Um, kind of always found a way. Uh, even when I was growing up, I mean, from the, for the first two, three years, I couldn't drive. Mm -hmm. And my older brother, my older brother stepped up and he was my, like, chauffeur. He used to drive me to, like, 40 minutes to Brantford Golf Club to, to practice every day. And he would just hang out while I spent the day. And um, so, I mean, I'd, I've been so fortunate that uh, I had, like, a really supportive family. Uh, <laughs> even early in my playing career, my younger brother was still in high school. Um, and... Actually, no, he was in college when I graduated. He had just started, and so his summers, he would come and caddy for me. And so it was kind of a, you know, a, a family, mm -hmm. kind of a family affair that kind of got me through it. And, and what, what's been your experience as, as, a, as a woman in the game? Like, I, I know golf has traditionally been uh, sort of an old man's game, as, as you would say, but, like, the growth amongst amongst female uh, golfers has has grown so much over the especially the last 20 years. Uh, how how's that? What's been your experience there? 
Yeah, there's a lot of things to say. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, golf is a gentleman's game. I mean, that's kind of how it started. And uh, probably until maybe five or ten years ago, it still was a very male-dominated profession. Um, the women's game has picked up a lot. It's gotten a lot more notoriety, a lot more attention. Um, PGA and LPGA are doing some things now together that are kind of bringing the two the two sides together. Because you look at men's and women's tennis, for example, mm -hmm. and they found a way to kind of level the playing field, uh, even payouts, those kind of things at the big tournaments. Um, so I think women's golf is making a charge. I think the popularity has definitely grown, especially in the most recent times that we've been going through. I think a lot of people are taking up the game. Um, even from a professional standpoint, I think as a female professional, there's a, a niche for it and there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a need. And I have a, a s kind of a skill that is needed and wanted at a lot of golf clubs. Um, but I think it's, it's getting more and more popular. And I think you're going to see a lot more women. I mean, a lot of the women, girls I coached, even here at UBC, um, have turned professional and are working at local clubs, which is awesome to see mm -hmm. because that just grows the game. So. And and you speak about your experience as a, as a coach. You you're a teaching professional, and, and part of that is coaching. Uh, you, you started your coaching career at, at back at Stanford, and then have continued now to, to UBC here in here in uh, Vancouver. Um, can you talk about that transition a little bit? Yeah, it was probably one of the hardest times in my life, trying to make the decision to give up playing competitively. Um, you know, there are, there are other reasons for that, uh, some health reasons for that. But, um, yeah, I, I had to make some very tough decisions to kind of give up the game. And um, so I did, the first time I did in 2008, and I was kind of serendipitous. I, at the exact, around the exact same time, I was offered by my old coach at Stanford to come and be the assistant uh, at Stanford. And so I jumped on that. I went and did that for three years. And within that three years I started to feel better mm -hmm. I think I wasn't on the road I wasn't traveling I had a more balanced lifestyle uh, so I started feeling better and I still felt competitive and so after three years of doing that I made a decision to quit and go try to play again uh, in 2010 mm -hmm. and unfortunately it it, uh, it didn't pan out I think my body just it wasn't ready for all the all the stresses that mm -hmm. came with it uh, of being on the road and traveling and long days but um, yeah, then I, I, I quit. I made that final decision to give up professional competitive mm -hmm. golf. And, yeah, then made the final transition to, to becoming a full-time coach. And, and, and you're uh, one of those reasons or w one of those reasons that you had to make that decision was uh, because you were, di you were living with lupus, right? Correct. Yeah. And, and what, what are some of the challenges that, that you then deal with trying to manage your health but also try to, to like, live not only a normal life but also maybe trying to play golf or, or coach golf? Yeah, I, so I was, I was, I had a blood disorder when I was 17 um, and got that all handled. Um, after a couple years, I was back, back to normal. We got things sorted out. And um, in the middle of my kind of playing career in college is when I was diagnosed with lupus, uh, basically like January, February of 2000. Um, and yeah, the challenges, I mean, the triggers for the lupus were sun and stress, which mm -hmm. were basically my job description. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I, I fought through it. I mean, I had a lot of doctors tell me, you should quit. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is not, this is not what you should be doing. And I was kind of hard-headed and stubborn. Um, and I just kind of pushed through it. I, I had a lot of really bad days and a lot of really good days and uh, a lot of disappointments and a lot of victories and, and thrills that I never would have experienced had I not kind of pushed myself to try. So... Uh, from a competitive standpoint, it was tough. I mean, I would get a lot of like inflammation, mm -hmm. hands, you know, body, everything would be inflamed. You feel like you have like the flu and you weigh 300 pounds and you can't walk and move. Um, so those were the days that were challenging. You wake up in the middle of a tournament and you feel like that, you just have to withdraw. So those were kind of what I, what I struggled with. And it just got to the point where it was, the flare ups were lasting longer mm -hmm. and I couldn't quite pop out of them fast enough. And so, the decision was kind of in my face to make. For sure, and we've seen other golfers uh, it, like it. Like it's not a not an easy decision to to decide that you can't play anymore, and, and that must be, like making that transition to to something else is 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 a hard one. And like, but you've transitioned into still staying in the game in, in, in the game that you love, and like what. 
staying in golf, has, has it really, uh, do you still love the game as much as you used to? You know, it's an interesting question. I mean, I've always thought and wondered, even now, should I be doing something else? Should I go back to school? Should I, you know, go back and study something else, try something else? But, like, golf has just always been my passion. It's what I love. Um, and, you know, a big part of the reason why I'm coaching today and why I love coaching is my, my late coach. He, the guy who was my first teacher, um, he taught me a lot. He was a big role model and um, mentor for me. And he passed away in the middle of my playing career, kind of at the height of my playing mm -hmm. career. And it was probably one of the most devastating things that happened. Um, but his love for the game and what he did for me, and I saw what he was doing and building. He built his own driving range and little mini golf course, and he just had so much passion for the game mm -hmm. um, that I feel, in a way, I'm kind of continuing his legacy and his, like, his love of the game through me is continuing. And um, so, yeah, Leo, Leo Zampedro was his name, and he was just like an incredible human uh, in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'll never forget him. And there are a lot of days. Um, I'll tell you one really crazy story mm -hmm. that actually happened here at Riverway. Um, probably five years ago, I was going to fill a bucket of balls at the machine just around the corner, and the balls were filling into the bucket, and one ball fell out that was not a range ball, and on that ball there was a logo, and the logo said Hudson Junior Invitational. Now that means nothing to anybody here in Vancouver. But that was the first big international junior golf tournament that I ever played in. Mm -hmm. And I got into it because Leo knew the host of the tournament in Ohio, which is where he was from. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that was like one of the biggest signs in my life that I'm like exactly where I'm supposed to be doing exactly what I should be doing. Because any other person sees that golf ball, it's hit on the range and it's disappeared forever. But like for me, that was like... It was one of the coolest things to ever happen. So did you take it out and you, you oh, still yeah. hold it? Yeah, I still have it. <laughs> sure. And so speaking of Riverway and, and, and also coming back to, to being on the West Coast is where we are right now. We're uh, in Burnaby at Riverway, in Burnaby, British Columbia, Canada uh, at Riverway Golf Club, uh, which is, and I did the math, 4,300 kilometers from your hometown of Burlington, Ontario, which is in okay. central eastern Canada for those who are not too familiar with the Canadian geography. Uh, what attracted you to Canada's wet and west coast? So I think a big part of it was going to school at Stanford. Uh, I just, I fell in love with the west coast. Um, growing up, we did all our travels and all our family vacations down the east coast, you know, Florida, South Carolina, um, all those places that were easy, easily accessible. And I never came to Vancouver until maybe the year before I moved here. I'd come to do uh, the World Partnership Golf mm -hmm. Tournament. They asked me to come and, and help uh, raise some funds mm -hmm. and uh, so I came and I just I totally fell in love I went camping I went hiking I got to experience it was August so it was like you know 30 you're degrees gonna, if you're not like... gonna get sold on <laughs> Vancouver that's the time to be sold and you know I was at that I was at a transition point in my life as it was this is when I was kind of had quit playing professionally and was trying to make a career change and a decision of where I wanted to be next and I kind of with the way the weather is milder here mm -hmm. I think that also played into it you know, the humidity in Ontario and then the really cold temperatures in the winter are not really helpful for me, for mm -hmm. my condition. So the milder conditions and the ability to teach here all year round um, were attractive. <laughs> and so, of course, then you have the beauty of Vancouver. So. Well, for typical Vancouver, uh, it's November, middle of November. Uh, yeah. There are people out golfing behind us, there starting are. on the first tee. Uh, like it's beautiful. people are still still out there playing the game in the middle in the mi almost into winter and uh we expected that we were going to see a ton of rain today we didn't know where we were going to do this interview and, and record this show but we're able to sit underneath the sun or what's left of it at least yeah. and the skies are clear typical vancouver you never know what the you don't know what you're going to get here <laughs> so it's kind of uh it's the beauty of the place and uh, I, I get yeah, and obviously part of not living in Ontario is not having to dig yourselves out of dig, dig yourself out of snow all winter long. So that, that yeah, that's I, I, if I want to work if I want to work through the winter here, I can. I mean, typically I I like to travel and, and take some time off, and um, 
do that kind of thing just to kind of fill my soul because I'm, I'm used to traveling. Mm -hmm. I traveled for a big part of my life. So uh, that's typically what I would do in the winter. But this year, you know, we're dealing yeah. with this pandemic and so everything's a little different. Well, it, and even setting up for this interview, we've had to make sure that we maintain a, uh, a six feet, two meter distance between the, the two of us. And it's a little bit different for us that, that are do that do production as well. And, and for everybody, it's, it's a, yeah. been a big change. And um, like, but the one thing that has benefited from a, a pandemic like COVID-19 has been the game of golf. Funny enough, you were, you were mentioning it earlier. Golf has seen record uh, amount of rounds in, in Canada and the United States this year. And, and uh, do you chalk up the, the, the increase in popularity of the game uh, to it's just so easy to social distance on a golf course? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's probably the number one reason. I think a lot of people were looking for things to do. A lot of people that I've started teaching have said it's been on their bucket list for years to learn golf, and now is their chance. Um, we are sitting at Riverwood, which is the busiest golf course in Canada. <laughs> just, I mean, it, this place is, it's just always hopping. There's always golfers, and this year has been unprecedented. Well, like, you can't get tea time. Yeah, exactly. There's lineups, you know, out the pro shop to the parking lot um, to get a spot on the driving range. Mm -hmm. um, it's just been like golf has blown up and the popularity has has become amazing you can't get clubs from manufacturers oh yeah everything's sold out yeah. um so it's it's lovely it's beautiful i mm -hmm. think it's it's a sport of a lifetime it's something that a lot of people maybe thought is not really a sport and like when am i ever going to do this and i think it's it's one of those things you can come and do on your own mm -hmm. in your own time for half an hour four hours whatever you want to give to it. And um, yeah, it's it's definitely grown in popularity. Well, it's funny that you mentioned how, how packed this golf course is. And it's w one place where you can only book a tee time two days in advance. And you have to wake up at six in the morning to get on the, the outdated City of Burnaby website to, to try and get a, a tee time. Done it a few times and never managed to get a tee time yeah. at this course. It's it's, it's like a, winning the lottery. Yeah. At this point, it's, <laughs> we signed up probably 4,000 people for online IDs during COVID. Wow. And you couple that with the probably four or five thousand already had them mm -hmm. we have ten thousand people vying for like 60 tea times a day yeah. so it's pretty much like winning the lottery and and this is one of three golf courses that you work out of and uh so riverway and burnaby being one uh with ubc at the at the university golf club in in uh, vancouver being another and vancouver golf club not in vancouver funny enough in coquitlam which is is uh about 25 30 minutes away and how do you manage your time be being at three different places yeah you know it's uh it's a unique kind of setup i've done for myself there's no other professionals in the lower mainland or probably anywhere that kind of do the schedule that I do um, I I think I like I like variety number one and I like I like the change of scenery and I like being able to help people in different areas I mean two of them are private uh, sorry one of them is private the other two are the are public facilities and um, I think I've just kind of I don't know how I even set it up this way but it's just become like you know you spend two to three days at each place or half days mm -hmm. And so I'm, I mean, wherever I go, I'm busy mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's worked out. I mean, I think in the long term, being settled at one place might be the way to go mm -hmm. um, as I get older. But uh, it's for me right now, it's fun. It keeps every day different, um, different people, different demographics. You know, certain places I teach a lot of kids, certain mm -hmm. places I teach a lot of, you know, older, um, older students or women. Um, and then at the private club, you get a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's been a it's been a nice kind of mix, eclectic mix of, of different facilities and students. And like, I, I know when I spent when I worked and spent a lot of time around uh, a college collegiate athletes, it, it it's infectious just being around uh, young people that are passionate not only passionate about uh, a particular activity or sport but are also trying to uh, focus on their education simultaneously and while they're doing that they're, 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 their, their time is split essentially taking on two full-time jobs is uh, that would probably be the equivalent in to, to most adults and like do you find it as infectious uh, being around university athletes uh, uh, as a as a uh, a coach? Yeah, you know, I it's probably if I had a regret in in my life so far, it'd be like leaving the job at Stanford. Um, it was such an amazing opportunity to be working with some of the best amateurs um, and 
knowing, like knowing their passion, like you said, like they, they were there for a reason and they had a path. And, um, you know, my job right now, for the most part, can be very transactional, right? Somebody comes in, they buy a package of three, five, ten lessons, maybe, mm -hmm. or one, and then you never see them again. Uh, whereas at the college level, when I was coaching, um, it's you get like a four-year plan, right? Mm -hmm. A girl or comes in, freshman, and you're going to get to work with them. And it's not just on their golf game, right? It's you're a mentor, you're a role model. You get to be like all these different things to them. And you, you become close and connected and you become invested in them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of the rewarding feature that kind of pulled me, pulled me to that and continues to. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, there's a different kind of reward and to being, you know, more, more involved in someone's development. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back to what's next for the future of Aslima Musani as we're on the golf show here, or on the sports show here, not that necessarily the golf show, but <laughs> as much as I would like to create an Ismaili golf show. But uh, uh, one of the, the, the challenges around golf is, is, is its accessibility. Uh, the cost of getting started, the cost of, of getting into the game is, is, is one thing, and the cost of sustaining that is uh, um, an, a whole other issue and, uh, issue. and it's very challenging for probably not only many people in our Jamaat, but also in the wider, wider community to get involved in, in golf. And it, it, have there been strides to try and get like more, like, like I guess we're, we would be considered a diverse community in golf, but also uh, uh, people that would be less affluent in, uh, to be able to, to get them involved in the game. Yeah, you know, that's, I think that's a challenge for a lot of even golf courses. I mean, here at Riverway, the, the programming is great. I mean, minus COVID year, right? We have a lot of junior programs that are very affordable. Um, like a four week program can bring a kid for like $60 for four weeks. And we have all the equipment here. We provide all the equipment for, for kids, for juniors. Um, so at the end of the day, the cost is, you know, the lessons and the buckets of balls, um, which to me is cheaper than even like a hockey or mm -hmm. a lot of other sports where you have to invest in field time and um, all that kind of stuff. But I think the, the kind of stereotype um, of golf is that it's expensive. And I think that that pushes a lot of people away. Um, and then the other piece of golf is it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It's not like a basketball game where in an hour you're, you know, suited up, showered, and home. Uh, here, you know, parents have to invest a lot more time. You have to travel to tournaments. Mm -hmm. You have to invest in two and three days at a time, go away, you know, hotels, all that kind of stuff, um, which at the end of the day it becomes expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to pick up the game and, and learn the game, um, I think there's more and more opportunities. And I think with that, if somebody has a talent, there's there's a lot of opportunity now for amateurs to get help from not only government bodies but um, like associations to help with covering costs and so mm -hmm. like my dream is one day there's no barrier right? mm -hmm. there's no barrier to starting this sport I think um, even being able to go to I went to Pakistan a few years ago to do TKN mm -hmm. and we went I went to teach golf there to oh. these kids that have never even seen a golf course yeah. they they can't even they can't even get into the gates of the golf course mm -hmm. and so like to see their faces and to see how much they loved it and they were excited to come back at six o'clock in the morning the next day uh, to learn something they don't really know they'll ever play again. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's that joy of just seeing somebody learn something new and, and you never know how it's going to impact them, right? So, so uh, Salima, uh, how's the game changed in, how, in the at least 20 years since you've been involved with it? Yeah, I, actually if I stop to think about how long I've been playing golf, Wow, that's a long time. Uh, almost, yeah, 27, 28 years I've been playing this game and or involved in this game. I wouldn't say I've been playing much in the last <laughs> seven years or so, but um, it's changed in so many different ways. I mean, equipment has changed dramatically. Um, the fitness of the game has changed, like, full, full mm -hmm. tilt. And that was that's probably due to somebody we all know, Tiger, Tiger Woods. Yeah. Um, he's completely changed the way kids are preparing and training and... Um, even from the mental side, uh, preparing themselves to play golf. And then I think the sport in general has changed. Just it's become kind of more cool. Um, mm -hmm. I know it was it was kind of a, we were talking about this earlier with the cost and all that. It was kind of looked at as a, you know, 
the rich man mm -hmm. affluent sport and mm -hmm. I think it's it's becoming a little more commonplace I think we go to the high schools here in Burnaby we teach golf in the gyms during the winter mm -hmm. uh, so during phys ed kids are being introduced to golf mm -hmm. which I know when I was in school nobody talked about golf golf was not something everybody got a chance to try mm -hmm. so I feel like it's becoming more mainstream I feel like it's it's more in your face little kids are walking around with Ricky Fowler hats and trying to look like you know all the different young golfers that are up and mm -hmm. coming and it's it's cool it's cool to play golf so and, I think it's changed a lot and guys like uh, like in pop culture when it comes to Snoop Dogg or P Diddy or are involved in golf or interested in golf and and, and there's you've seen like golf movies have taken off we yeah, all remember seeing athletes yeah. in other sports all these NBA players Tony Romo's and the mm -hmm. Steph Curry's and the Michael Jordan's who like they're, they play golf in their spare time. Oh, yeah. Golf is what they want to be doing. And so I think it's just becoming more mainstream. That's probably the best way I can kind of mm -hmm. summarize it is it's just becoming more popular to everybody. And so what now we talked about uh, experience coaching and your and your love for, for what you did uh, when you what you do at UBC and what you did at Stanford. What's what's next for you? What's the future looking like for Salima Musani? That's a good question. I mean, I think I think uh, I think I'll coach for as long as I possibly can. Uh, I love this sport too much, and I've obviously invested a lot into it. And um, I I don't know. I don't know for how long I'll be able to stand on a lesson <laughs> tee and and teach for you know eight, ten, twelve hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as I can do it, I think I'll I'll always have my hand in golf, and uh, and give back as much as I can. I mean. We are so fortunate as Ismailis to have these platforms mm -hmm. to give back and, and do volunteer work and, and give our, our seva and our time and our knowledge to things um, that we have specialties in. And so as much as I can impact and, and do that around the world, um, maybe maybe finding more time to do that is kind of mm -hmm. on my bucket list. And what can we do collectively as as Ismailis for, for our community here locally and internationally to, to make a sport and make physical activity more of a uh, not just something that you do on like like one or two days a week but that, that's something that you do on an everyday basis that is part of your lifestyle yeah I think it starts with I mean it starts with the families right like our our parents and having our parents be encouraging and, and introducing us to especially the young kids at a young age to being active uh, I think it's becoming more popular. There's AKYSB is providing all sorts of opportunities for kids for soccer and all different sports um, to do things on a regular basis and to be involved. And I think that just, it becomes part of your balanced lifestyle. I think um, it's becoming more apparent and I think health, health and wellness are, you know, getting more attention. Mm -hmm. And so I think naturally, naturally this next generation is going to grow up with more of that balance that maybe we didn't have um, or we weren't provided that opportunity um, and you know it's you getting to see we going through this whole pandemic and I think it, everybody's getting a new a new lease on life to like you know find this balance and and find things that you can do that are you know active and outside and keep you healthy mm -hmm. and mm, mm. <sighs> So now a couple fun questions. Who's your favorite golfer in the past and currently, both male and female? Well, you know, that's, those are tough questions. So I, obviously I love Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to play golf with Tiger Woods. Um, at Stanford? Well, not at Stanford. Mm -hmm. It was after I was, after I was done coaching. Mm -hmm. um, happened to be at the, it's one of those right place, right time moments. Uh, I was in Florida, um, just practicing or I don't even remember my circumstance at the time but a good friend of mine um, Kevin Hall he's a deaf golfer he was actually featured on the golf channel yesterday. oh cool um, he was getting the opportunity to play with Tiger mm -hmm. and so I had jokingly said like oh let me caddy for you <laughs> and he was like well obviously my dad's going to fly in yeah he was texting this all to me because yeah. he's deaf um, and I was like oh of course well that would have been fun yeah and like six o'clock the night before he texts me says show up at Isleworth at 6 a.m. bring your golf clubs uh -huh. and so I showed up and I got to spend the whole day we had breakfast we practiced we played 18 holes um, I watched most of it I decided <laughs> to put my clubs away because I wanted to be I wanted to be near Tiger I wanted mm -hmm. to watch what he was doing yeah. I wanted to, to hear his shots I wanted to see what he was doing and um, it was an incredible day then we had lunch and we practiced some more um, so that's one of those days and mm -hmm. moments and experiences I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. um, Tiger had just won like six PGA events in a row at the time. 
he was getting ready to go to the match play, mm -hmm. um, which he eventually lost. But um, I was there in like his absolute prime. Yeah. And I probably met him seven subsequent times wow. after that as the coach at Stanford and, mm -hmm. and all that. And um, like amazing individual, like res very, I respect him in mm -hmm. all ways from his golf talent. And uh, obviously we all have our opinions on his <laughs> personal life. And uh, I think there's a lot of that, that, I mean, it's not in my, it's not in my place to judge mm -hmm. him. Um, but yeah, it's as a golfer and to look up to somebody and their work ethic and their talent level, like Tiger Woods for sure. Mm -hmm. um, kind of in this new crop of golfers, uh, I'm drawn to like, you know, the these new this new young crop of like Colin Morikawa yeah. and Xander Shoffley, um, all these young Matthew Wolf that are coming mm -hmm. in um, with this really raw talent. I think what it's doing now is reminding me of when I was mm -hmm. you know 13 to 18, and there was not a care in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I. You win, I won the Canadian Juniors twice, and I look back, I don't remember any of it, but like those were big tournaments, mm -hmm. and I, but I don't even remember how I was thinking, except I can look back and think, I just, I didn't have any fear. Yeah. Um, you don't have the experience and all the like bad things that happen, you know, to create demons in your head, and so you're just like a raw, fresh, un, whatever. I yeah, know, unencumbered. Like, there's no, like, yeah, there's yeah. just no, there's nothing to hold you back, yeah. and I watch them now, and, and I think what it's doing is kind of, I'm remembering what that was like to kind of play. Now I play and I'm like, I get so nervous and I get so many expectations and I don't sleep and I worry and I worry and I worry about what the next shot's gonna do mm -hmm. and where it's gonna go. And, and it's just such a different mindset from when I was 15 and I didn't really care. You chased your golf ball, you found it and you hit it again, yeah. you know? And so I, I think I'm really enjoying watching that kind of fearless golf in these young, the young new players. And we just saw Bryson De DeChambeau just do that uh, pretty much all weekend, for better or for worse, yeah, but yeah. Uh, he, he no fear. Kinda, yeah, he yeah. just let it all out yeah. and um, played his game. He has his own science behind what he yeah. does. And again, that's like the new the new wave of, of golfers that are that are coming. And so, w one last question: favorite golf movie. Do you have a favorite golf movie? Favorite golf movie? Uh, you know, when you say it, the first thing that comes to mind is like Tin Cup. Tin Cup, yeah. But yeah. I think I just, that's also like, that was just, there's such an epic scene in that movie where Kevin Costner just keeps dropping balls. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he's just not gonna, he's not gonna let go till he does it. And that's, yeah. I think that's kind of, that sums up a golfer. We're pretty hard headed. <laughs> we, we keep beating our heads against the wall to, you know, perfect something that's imperfectable, but. <laughs> It is what it is. The, imper the perfect and imperfect game. And I think that's a good way to, to leave it off. Uh, thanks to Salima uh, for coming on the sports show and, and uh, on a Smiley TV. And, and we'll be sure that we'll, we'll do this again. Yeah, thank you, Samir. Uh, I really appreciate it. Oh, no, it was fun. Well, uh, thanks for watching the sports show. And, and we'll, you'll see, I don't know what, what, what's coming up next, but uh, there'll be lots. And enjoy. Thanks a lot.